Our purpose is to understand. Our name for this program is Background. Today, August 30th, 1954, Background examines the face of Southeast Asia. Good evening. Eight weeks ago, when we all knew that at least part of Indochina was headed down the communist drain, background sent camera correspondent Eugene Jones to Southeast Asia to watch it happen. We told him to live with Asians, and he did. From his report has come this third edition of background, a report on the problem we in the United States must face if we're to hold on to what is left in Southeast Asia. The face you see behind me is that of the head man of an Indo-Chinese village whose opinions of us you will hear later on. He is an old man, a wise man, a responsible man. Yet, three weeks ago, he gladly turned his village over to communism. Why he is lost to us and what to do about it, these questions make the problem the West faces now. And a week from today at the Manila Conference, where eight countries will try to work out a defense plan for Southeast Asia, men like him will be important absentees. Happily, the conference will take place in the Philippines, a country which is Asian, yet which is free and is closely tied to us. An Asian country which has proved false, the central propaganda of communism in Asia. The untrue argument that Asian nationalism and communism go hand in hand. From the Philippines, here then is our reporter, and here is his background story. I am standing at the foot of Mount Harriet in central Luzon. This is the area known as the breadbasket of the Philippine Islands. On that mountain, even today, there are huts, communist guerrillas, but most of them have come down from the mountain and rejoined the society of free men. Their story is the success story in the fight against communist aggression in Asia. The best success story of the Philippines is the one you get from the man behind the plow. Ignacio Zagana, once an educated city man, but then for eight years, a top communist guerrilla, had such a story. Sit down here, Sir John. We can talk here. Ignacio, few Americans have had the opportunity to talk with a Philippine communist. What brought you down from Mount Orion? Mr. John, the reasons are all about us. For eight years, I was a hook guerrilla. We had to move every night. Food was scarce. We were often hungry. This is Edgardo. He was born up in those hills. There was no chance for him to play there. And this is my wife. Mena, we had been together for eight years. Some good times, some very bad times, but she's a good wife. Let's go back to the beginning. What made you a hug? When the Japanese came, I went into the hills to fight against them as a guerrilla. Even then, communists were among us. Gradually, we were converted. Until recently, things were very bad here. I, I don't know how to say this, but what I mean is, we were afraid of the army. For then, our government was broken and corrupt. We just had no faith. So, I became a communist official, a political director among the hook guerrillas. When did you begin to change in your heart and in your mind? We had been on several raids. Many innocent civilians were killed. I protested very much. This was not the People's Liberation Army I had believed in. It was then that the communists turned against me. I was humbled. This, uh, this bullet wound is what I got for eight years of service with the hook. But even before that, I knew they were wrong. One last question. In your opinion, 
Do a majority of the people here feel that communism has failed in the Philippine Islands? Yes. I think I understand those sentiments, Ignacio. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Goodbye. In Ignacio's village of San Luis, I saw the results of what the Philippine government called Operation Redeemer. And as I wandered through it with Ignacio, it seemed normal and undistinguished. But this was the most dramatic fact anyone could bring back from this part of the world. I had to keep reminding myself that this breadbasket of Luzon was once communist territory. One of the few pieces of communist territory, the free world has won back anywhere. Almost all these villages were recently dedicated communist fighters shut off from the free world and its ideas. They had been led back by a government of their own and by religion. The old church built two centuries ago had been all but destroyed in the fighting, but the shell of the church was crowded every Sunday with worshippers who once were reds. Outside the village and beyond the church, Filipino soldiers patrolled for Huck still hiding in the recesses of a now useless mountains. Asian communists had been defeated by Asians, and the victory was the victory of a native Asian leader, Philippine President Roman Magsaysay. As he took from my camera, I could feel the strength and the honesty of the man. system of these people that made them books or communists so established a laboratory in Camp Murphy, in the same manner that a doctor puts out his own laboratory to find out what germs are inside his patient in order to know how to kill the disease. In this army laboratory, we questioned the hundreds of surrendered and captured hooks or communists, especially from the bread basket of this country in central Luzon. After three months, we found out that the germ which drove these people into the mountains and became communists are food and shelter. They were mad with the government, and they feel that they're at the end of the line, that there is no way out but to become communist. So we started to give the medicine to kill this germ. The medicine is a farm of their own with current title, a farmhouse, a carabao, a plow. We made the settlements very attractive. Electric light, running water, community life, school buildings, basketball courts, because we wanted to show to the communists in the mountain, mountain that those who surrender are given land that there is no more need, that there is no more need to stain the mountains with the rats, with the snakes and malaria, that it's worthwhile going down and surrendering to the government. Many surrendered, almost 9,500 of them when I was Secretary of Defense. Of course, Mr. Magsaysay did not do it all alone. He had a number of advantages in his successful handling of communist rebellion in the Philippines. For one thing, his island country is separated by broad water from the Asian mainland, and the armies and the fleets of the United States could and did give him a military shield which protected him and his people from the blackmail of armed force. Communism, you know, has never yet captured a country without using major armed force or the threat of armed force. But more important still, we, the United States, after half a century as the ruling colonial power, got out of the Philippines under our own steam. Experience seems to be proving a new rule, that the successful colonial power is one which gets out gracefully, rather than waiting to be thrown out. Other countries have done the same and have profited as we have. Britain gave up India, Pakistan, Ceylon, and Burma. The Dutch got out of Indonesia. 
There have been important exceptions to the rule. Malaya is one of them for strategic reasons. But generally, the rule has held true. And the French in Indochina chose to try to buck that rule. They had strong arguments on their side. The advances they brought in public health, scientific agriculture, and education did add up to an excellent record, as good as that in any colonial area, as good, in fact, as that in some countries we call free. But with communist China next door in all its armed might, and Indo-Chinese communism armed at home and on the march, the French record was not good enough to succeed. And that's what Gene Jones reported to us from Hanoi. Well, maybe the French have done great things in Indochina, but what I saw was their mistakes. The mistakes they'll be remembered by. The French section of Hanoi looked like a comfortable Paris suburb. The slums belonged to the natives. Inside the French athletic club, Frenchmen were relaxing. Nothing wrong with it, but as I watched them, I knew they were losing a major war. I knew it, and they knew it. But I couldn't tell it from looking at them. In the same part of Hanoi, the highest French civil official in North Vietnam was more interested in news from Paris than in the native evacuation. When he talked to me, it was about culture, sincere and kind of meaningless. France has been present in Vietnam for more than 80 years. During that period, the Vietnamese have wonderfully taken hold of French culture, for which they feel a deep attraction. And uh, I think that among all Asian peoples, they have succeeded in grasping the spirit of the West and of the East. This is our best gift, our best reward, and I think that the best hope of their future. I have many very good Vietnamese friends, and I feel quite unhappy about the situation. And to see all these people obliged to leave their homes with little hope to come back again. Anyway, my duty is to help them, and I'll do it with all my heart. The French say there has been friendship and the gift of culture, but we don't like that culture. We want more schools, better living conditions, laws designed to protect the Vietnamese, and not to control them like cattle. In this city, see the contrast, a few fine homes, but occupied by those who do not belong among us. The rest is slums, filled, restrictions. Even on the street sign, a language other than our own has long been substituted. Well, my Vietnamese friend was certainly right about what you saw. But his major charges against the French were unfair. Whether his resentment of the signs of the French was the bitterness of a thwarted anti-French nationalist, or whether he was a communist Viet Minh, I never knew. As I said, maybe the French have done great things in Indochina, but they never became part of Indochina. The cafes where the army officers hung out were little bits of France. No natives allowed. other side of the picture. Asia, I've found, is a continent of slums, and Hanoi was always a poor town, even before the French came. The floods of war refugees made it worse. But the failure of the French to do something about this turned out to be, I think, as important as their failure at DNB and food. You find filth, poverty, unending hunger, and early death all over Asia. Death is not unimportant even in the slums of Hanoi. I saw the funeral of a young boy going through the native streets, and the music of the band was like, like nothing I'd ever heard before. People who've never been to Asia say life is cheap in the East. 
I found that to the people who live it, life there is just as dear as in Illinois. Beyond Hanoi, I found a different world. What you see is different, what you hear is different, the people are different. French culture had not ventured this far. Tonight, August 30th, Hanoi is still French, but already, rule from the Kremlin has spread all the way to this priestess, going through one of the oldest religious rituals known to Asia. The ceremonies of the Buddhist great vehicle had been reduced by the centuries to almost mumbo-jumbo. The temple when I was in it was a place of airy quiet, and outside the communist rulers were coming nearer. Just outside the temple is the village of Tuden, and the first thing I saw was ruins. In the fight of the West against communism of the East, a few shells had found the Viet Minh enemy, but the rest destroyed the houses of Vietnam and made enemies. And yet no more than a few yards from the ruins of modern war, the ancient rice paddies were unaffected. For 40 centuries in Tudan, a day's work meant a man and his water buffalo plowing up the mud. This farmer was one of the few whose buffalo had not been shot as a potential enemy and served up as stakes for the French garrisons. Peasants hate the French. I saw the villages of Tudan watering their paddies as the ancient Egyptians had watered their fields in the time of the pharaohs. In both places, manpower was too cheap to bother inventing machines. This, I thought, was changeless Asia. But I was wrong. The 20th century was rolling across those rice fields. Listen. What I first thought was a work song as old as the land, sort of a yo-ho, heave-ho, was the village women singing, Ho Chi Men Will Come. He will give us the land. Now Ho Chi Minh has cut the land, so have the communists. For five days I stayed in the village of Tu Din, never going back to Hanoi. I arranged to meet with a village chieftain, president they call him. My interpreter's name was Dudok Tree. I think this interview was the most revealing thing I found in Southeast Asia, and Dudok Tree made it possible. He was more than a translator of words. He understood me. He understood his elders. Without him, we could not have understood each other. He bridged our two worlds. This is our village president. He has called a meeting for you. I thank them for coming. Tell them I would like to talk with them briefly. hello. Uh, I've been told that the Viet Minh are always close by in this area. Do they occupy this village at night? He laughs at you. He says the good men are everywhere. Even now, they are in this village. Just some of them who are waiting for their comrades to come in and control the village uh. at night. Soon they shall not only come at night, but they shall stay in the day also. For this village will soon be a Vietnamese village. They know that you have been here with your camera for the past five days, and they laugh at you. Doctor, this is the crucial hour for Vietnam, yet the people here seem to care so little. Why is that? Ah, uh, 
chúc mua thuốc nổ cho ta thôi nhá con lợn con gà cho ăn đi không nó đói chú à, chúng mày phải mang đi mà chăn they cannot for anything it is bred into them for hundreds of years of occupancy by other powers à, what shall I say à, they are beaten down Vietnamese people believe do as little work as possible think as little as possible and try only to eat and live from day to day how do they feel about the French at this time cái nào cụ lăng ta đợt này được uh, vui vẻ với dưới cả đấy chứ cụ cảm ơn con uh, chúng tôi vui vẻ lắm trời mưa vui vẻ cày cấy vui vẻ anh em đồng bào đủ hết cả vui vẻ for one thousand years we were ruled by the Chinese then came the French then came the Chinese and then the French again they as masters and we are under them we bow down to them however Always, our people want to recover their freedom. Very soon now, this village will be in communist hands. Do the people understand this thing? Do they welcome the change? Gặt đầu đấy nhá, gặt luôn đi, gặt nữa nè, à thôi. He waits for communism to accept it. But he cannot answer your question because he does not truly know communism. I say. You must understand that a place like this village is a whole big world to these people. When it holds poverty, hunger, and illiteracy, it is the proper breeding ground here for communism. He says the Vietnamese people are very poor and have been under the French for many years. They do not know what this communism is, but any change will be a good one, they think. Have they any faith in their present form of government? Thế nào hiện nay chúng ta có được yên ổn làm ăn trong vùng của cổ không? Một, hai, ba, bốn, năm, sáu, bảy, tám. Mười, mười một, mười hai. Mà thiên hạ được mùa dễ làm ăn, ngày mưa gió thiên hạ được mùa dễ làm ăn. Anh em vui vẻ đông đúc. He says we are very confused. Some of our government have left us, but we hope very much that the future will be better than this. The picture of Bao Dai is still hanging on the wall. He has worked for, with a friend in Vietnam. But he has never come into this village. If he had, things would be much better. Thank them for meeting with me. Is there anything else they would like to say? I think he does not want to speak any more to you. He feels that the time is past for talk now. I'm sorry. Sorry for the Vietnamese who care so little. Sorry for the friends who spend so much blood and money here, but who stayed too long. These children of the village of Tudin right now are being brought up as communists. In 10 years, perhaps, there'll be soldiers and a communist army. In northern Indochina, the twilight of communist occupation is rapidly falling. For a nation of the West, which controlled this area for many years, paid little heed to the call of a people.
peace of a sort has come after eight years of war. But the village of Tuden and those to whom I spoke so recently are already within the communist zone of their choice. That choice, to me, is the real tragedy, the real enigma of this report from Southeast Asia, August 1954. We have indeed lost a lot in North Vietnam, about nine million people, hard coal, iron ore, tin, tungsten, and manganese, all these headed now for the smelters and the munitions plants of Red China, and we've lost face. The communists got less than they wanted, but we lost more than we could afford. Vietnam is now divided as Korea is divided. Now our promise of support has lost some of its weight and meaning even to those Asians who do recognize the dangers from communist aggression. This loss of confidence in us is one handicap facing the Manila Conference. Another is its makeup. The United States, France, Britain, Australia, and New Zealand are not Asian powers. Only Thailand, Pakistan, and the Philippines are. The nations we really need to make a Southeast Asia treaty effective will not be present. India, Burma, Indonesia, and Ceylon. They don't trust us enough to unite with us, and they don't fear Red China enough to unite against her. The alliance itself will be something far less than NATO, although anything Mr. Dulles can get at that conference can be considered an achievement. But the best he can do at Manila will not alone stem the tide in Southeast Asia. Remember, the most successful stands against communism in that part of the world have been led not by Westerners, but by Asians. We must be found out that the germ which drove these people into the mountains and became communist are food and shelter. They were mad with the government and they feel that they're at the end of the line, that there is no way out but to become communist. So we started to give the medicine to kill this germ. The medicine is a farm of their own with current cycle, a farmhouse, a carabao, a plow. Except for a few men like him, our ideas have come to Asia in Western dress. Communism has come to Asia in Asian dress. To them, we seem alien, we seem remote, and we seem different. We Americans are further handicapped by our own past treatment at home of Americans who are not white, by the fact that the only atom bomb ever dropped in war was dropped by us on Asiatics. We are different from Asiatics, and we have not yet learned how to make that difference disappear. We must encourage more men like Mag Tsai Tsai to organize the Asian fight against communism. Western arms, political skill, and economic aid will not by themselves be enough. The Third World War could start quite as easily in Southeast Asia as World War I started in the Balkans. If that war is to be prevented, there is much to do in improving our own approach to Asia, and happily much that can be done. Next week, background is coming much closer to home, and we're going to have some fun in the process. This, in case you didn't know, is a political, is a political election year, and we're going to have a look at American politics. This is, I'm Joseph C. Harsh, good night. <laughs>